I'm making a little pen drawing, more or less in the style of Titian, of uh, Tarquin and Lucretia, the painting I've been working on to demonstrate. Titian would make a series of uh, studies or sketches, little doodles, in pen and ink, working very, very quickly, would make many of them in order to stimulate his imagination and to form a composition of some kind from which he could do his painting. He could do anything between six and 20, I mean, it varies, of course. Titian was born in a little village in the northern part of Italy. We think he was born about 1477. He lived an extremely long life, nearly 100 years, apparently. And he died 1576. We know this. He had a, a rather posh funeral, considering the plague was in existence at that time. Titian's parents were middle class, and his father was a notary, and he sent Titian and his brother Francesco down to Venice to study in the studio of a little-known painter. His brother left the studio shortly afterwards, but Titian went on to the studio of the Bellini. The Bellinis were, of course, famous for their uh, religious paintings on panel, mainly, practically exclusively. And he would have done enormous panels. He was uh, a man of gigantic vision, so he painted much larger than they did in the physical sense. Enormous panels of religious assumptions, depositions, and so forth. He then uh, collaborated with Giorgione, who was a sweet, gentle figure, different man altogether. Giorgione and Titian are the same as Rubens and, and uh, Van Dyck. It's difficult to tell technically or aesthetically their work when they work on the same painting. Titian would have learned a great amount from Giorgione. Titian achieved incredible success in his own lifetime. He was knighted, made a great fuss of or in all the courts of Europe. His work was de in demand everywhere, and he was um, almost as successful as David Hockney is today, probably. He was obviously a, a liver upper. I mean, he loved the sensuous life and frequented brothels and had orgies in his house and all that. Um, he was terrifically passionate. Well, obvious from his work, and uh, you can tell a painter by his passion. One can't imagine uh, someone like uh, Botticelli having orgies, particularly. I shouldn't imagine so very aesthetic life. Titian was probably a very physical man in every aspect, very strong, um, and therefore it shows in his work and would show in his life. Tarquin and Lucretia was commissioned by Una. Uh, no. Tarquin and Lucretia was not commissioned in that sense by Philip II. He was just asked him to paint some pictures of a semi-erotic nature. And of course, as is always the practice, that most artists of this kind are asked to paint naughty pictures by naughty patrons. And of course, they made either religion the excuse to create nudity, or they um, went in for the secular and were blatantly erotic in their depiction of scenes. And in the case of Lucretia and Tarquus, it is sex and violence. And uh, this isn't why I've chose to paint it, but I mean, um, you can see the enormous amount of serious thought that went into creating this very human relationship. It's all created in just two simple figures in an action which depicts violence. But the actual movement of drapes and every, all the ancillary uh, things around it that, uh, that go to make up the picture, you know, all tell a story. Every stroke in it has a meaning. Uh, from a few preliminary sketches, uh, Titian would have achieved this line drawing, which would probably be carried out by apprentices of some kind. Um, either prick and pounce, or tracing, probably prick and pounce. This is a lot of little dots on a piece of paper. They pounce through chalk, creating a movement like that. He would then most probably take an ordinary piece of white chalk and create the form in the way of a very quickly 
the design of the picture would come as you felt the lights falling on the body and so forth with chalk and establishing the light and shade of the painting and forgetting colour altogether. The colour is the last thought in the mind. This canvas has been sized and primed and given a ground of bread bowl. So he would establish more or less his light and dark areas, as I'm doing here very quickly, and then he would pick up tempera, grisaille, and I'll show you one finished. Grisaille means grey, means one tone. This painting is achieved by the pure use of white, nothing else. It is used by the thickness and thinness of the colour. The impasto, the thick pieces, being built up to create a kind of bar relief of tone. The thinner places are the canvas left, the red bowl underpainting. So over the thick, blending out into the half tones, into the shadows. And having achieved this, with a lot of concentration and thought, but done with great speed. This took, I think, about three hours, to, or two or three hours to achieve. He would have taken probably less time being a greater painter. On this, he would use the tempera. Now, I've got egg tempera here. And one of the great secrets of the old chaps was the use of green in the flesh where the flesh touches the bone closest. The tendency is for a greenish appearance to happen. If you paint a skull under a face, it has more strength and guts than just painting a superficial Max Factorish type thing. This is an old practice. It's practiced in icons. Now, I put that on quite arbitrarily, but with this, you can wipe off and create a kind of skull under there, and using, of course, the back of a head skull. The, the hair is a superficiality. And once this has gone through the whole painting, it lends a kind of tonal quality that can be painted upon after. I'm gradually building up a thick impasto. The modern techniques use things like, say, the palette knife which is quite good, Rembrandt and Titian, both experts in the use of the palette knife. But of course, it's a little bit hit and miss for drawing delicate form. At this stage of the painting, called the Imprimatura, was probably done by one of the apprentices, because uh, Titian worked uh, in a studio full of people. Uh, there was many as 30 men would work there from the top painters right down to the little boys who ground the colours and prepared palettes. Each person worked for, roughly speaking, uh, seven to nine years apprenticeship, and they would go forth in their own way to form their own studios and their own practices. And um, the hair catches the light. There are little curls down here. Then he comes onto metal. This is a gold gilt tip. These are highlighted. Then there's a ring here in the forefinger. So you make a ring. Then there's a sharp blade. And he's not unsubtle enough to bring this light right through to the end. This would be crude. Imagine something up there's breaking this. He has a darting, bouncing light to the point. I'm shaking. This is one of the great pieces of art. This, any staff, any straight object, instead of doing the whole thing, you do a bit, leave a bit, do a bit, and the eye bounces along there. It's practiced in landscape painting, in mountains and hills by the great masters. We have light, reflected light, caught upon this forearm. He would spend considerable time on that. that the original has 
red on the stockings. And this is not the final red. I emphasize this is a, a touch of red here and there. In temper to give. I'm scrubbing it on loosely, leaving the shadow of the green, which will receive a glaze of alizarin crimson later to create form. And you will see how the color, the red, immediately registers in a terribly, terrifyingly pungent color because of the relative cold colors around it. But it's necessary to establish early on the color relationships. All color is relative. You can make green look like red and red look like green with relative colors, certain effects. Now, all color affects the color adjacent to it. So as we have the red here, it will bounce back on the lady's patella there, a bit down the shin, a little warmth in here to cheer it up. And as he worked, Titian would have thought of the, these relationships and worked very freely. Now the shoe in the original is in fact almost a silk slipper. He leaves the soul cool, and we're now going into the realms of color, Anton, cool against warm, against cool, against warm, against cool. If we warm the outermost parts of the pillows in this warm yellow, there's no need to be too finicky at this stage. You just, because your drawing is underneath all the time, will stand up to any amount of painting. If you make mistakes, you can wipe it off. And this is the beauty of having a grisaille, a temper, underpainting. In the original, to create the form, again in yellow, there is a band running up the gentleman's breeches here somewhere. So you do that now in temper. And there's a design there. This is indicated with a few bright yellow strokes because they will be toned down when it's glazed eventually. At a certain stage in the painting, when the temper's uh, finished, the grisaille's been made, there's an endeavor made by the Venetian school especially to establish the greys in the picture. This is done by the Bottizar system. It's a system unique to the Venetian school in which a transparent white or other color is applied to the painting all over in this method. This is called scumbling. Usually the apprentice would do this. They had large brushes. Remember the Venetians worked on an enormously large scale, the largest known to history of art. 40 or 50 feet by 30 or 40 feet. And by applying this color all over, it's in fact a complete scumble. It was beaten out with brushes and sponges. You cannot obtain greys in any other way. This has never been, I shouldn't imagine, has ever been shown 
for centuries. This technique is completely lost. All the highlights are white. So that again, we get the depth. You see, observe a bit like this. How crude the red becomes when without the scumble. And this can be gently softened back. And it's up to the artist how much or how little he takes off or puts on. But by taking more time than I've, I'm able to, you can more or less paint the picture with the scumble, which is then glazed upon after. I'm applying a glaze to the background of this painting in order to bring the figures out to the foreground a bit. Also, to re-establish some of the tonal qualities that were lost in the scumble, the overall scumble. It is not to be imagined for one moment that the masters worked in one coat or two coats. They were successive coats. This would have been done by probably what we'd call the, the first painter, you know, in the studio. And Titian would wait until all these successive coats had dried and then he would paint in alla prima, which means in one go, at the end of it all. Titian would have worked in an extremely fast way, being a master, of course, they didn't muck about. And hit a little touch there to delineate this bit and a lot of thickers there, you see. Impasto gives the feeling of the form of the drape. There's a little, let's call it, courtesy touch there to hide the vagina. And down here, and then the folds would be whispered in <coughs> gently in the half-tone area. And the piece I put across here, initially, well, is avoided so that it appears that you can see through. Now, when I use, on his next coat, when he uses a more oily medium than I'm using now, that will appear more transparent with further washes. All these lights are picking up and he played around with this so that the whole thing becomes more ethereal. This is Indian yellow I'm using now. Very interesting color. It's made from feeding cows with mango leaves until their urine is so strong that when it's dried in the sun, it forms these yellow crystals of what, which this is made. and so on throughout the picture there. With the same color, you would pick up on the highlights I placed there before to make this gold, if there's any bits of gold anywhere like on the bracelets and so forth. Again, this is spreading the color through the painting. And after this, you give this, all this up here would have another glaze and so on right through the picture. Then we go on to another colour, which I will show you on the next painting. We'll start by redrawing the lady. She's now in a nebulous state. These neutral colours need warming. This process was called, in the, by the ancients, tinting the edges, bringing warmth into the dead flesh. It's a bit like a baby's bum, really. Where flesh meets flesh, <coughs> a warmth comes. Where there is heavy flesh, blood makes for 
warmth. Titian used his, well, a lot of painters use their fingers to blend, just as ladies make their faces up, they warm it up with a little tinge. Whilst we're on that, we'll make this gentleman a little warmer. Avoiding to get it too ruddy. Now, a wonderful thing happens in all ancient paintings. They observed many years ago, centuries and centuries ago, that the extremities, extremities of the body are warmer than the other parts, except for lips and things like that. So the feet and hands are always more or less completely, at one stage, covered in red. Now, this lady's flesh is ready to take the final glaze. Well, I've warmed it before. I'm now taking an intermediate turn, caressing, qualifying. And this is where Titian's knowledge of anatomy would come into play. Broadly speaking, from the underpainting of green, what I'm applying now, a transparent, semi-opaque scumbles and glazes to create a kind of warmth, flesh warmth. This is where he used his fingers to, to smooth, to blend the colors one into another. I'm now doing a few final touches to this head. Of course, Titian would have worked much more than this. He himself said that um, even 40 glazes is not enough. This is not necessary to say that he did 40 glazes on everything. This area here, most probably glazed very lightly, right through and then stippled out. I'm using this, but it's a piece of sponge, but Titian would have used a badger blender. The badger blender was used extensively in um, ancient painting because uh, of the property of taking off the superfluous and tamping out the colors so that they blended together, but hence the name badger blender. The whole of this area, after it's been caressed with the soft hairs of the blender, are then picked up again with a sable or bristle. Incidentally, if you can't afford to buy sable brushes and you soak a bristle brush for 48 hours in cold water and beat the ends out, you will have a very cheap and excellent soft brush. The ancients knew this, and they used this. It saves an enormous amount of money. And there we have the uh, more or less finished article. There's much more I could do to this painting. Obviously, there isn't time in the available space allotted. But Titian incidentally signed his name inside the shoe, and he would have... Um, gone over it until he was completely satisfied, as near as one can be with his work, probably some months. I would like to have spent another several weeks on this myself. I say that because he took three years, apparently, to do these things, but then he had to design it and make it. It's very easy to copy a thing, when, so it takes much, much less time. It is meant there's no respect to, disrespect to Titian. Thank you. Mm-hmm.